Hello, my friends. How are you? Welcome to another episode of the Jazz Real Book. Today, we will be looking at the song Afternoon in Paris. I am your host, Jay Sweet. Afternoon in Paris is a jazz standard written by John Lewis, a pianist who is best known for his work with the modern jazz quartet, one of the premier groups connected to the cool jazz or third stream movement, which is a style of blending jazz with classical elements. John Lewis recorded the track in 1949 while appearing on the album Sonny Stitt, Bud Powell, J.J. Johnson on Prestige Records. The track is still played with some degree of regularity. While it's not considered a typical song to perform at a jam session, it would not be considered entirely unusual to suggest playing it. I give it a jazz popularity rating of 5 out of 10. All right, so let's learn a little bit about the composer, John Lewis. As with many of the cool jazz innovators, pianist John Lewis's most significant impact would come in the 1950s. Lewis is most noted as the leader and the director of the modern jazz quartet. The group also included vibraphonist Milt Jackson, bassist Percy Heath, and initially drummer Kenny Clark. Clark was eventually replaced by Connie Kay. MJQ, or the Modern Jazz Quartet, is one of the most successful jazz groups ever. For over 40 years, the Modern Jazz Quartet mixed jazz and classical music and presented their cool jazz music in classical concert halls. By taking jazz outside of the club and moving it to these concert halls, John Lewis and the Modern Jazz Quartet helped introduce their brand of jazz to audiences that were not otherwise fans of the genre. Born in LaGrange, Illinois, John Lewis began studying classical piano at the age of seven. And as he continued to develop, he became inspired by the jazz big bands and solo pianists he heard on the radio and Lewis furthered his skills while attending the University of New Mexico, where he focused his studies on composition and piano performance. So it was 1942, John Lewis entered the Army, and he, that's where he met, befriended drummer Kenny Clark. Before Clark entered the service, he was already known in Manhattan as one of the pioneering drummers of the early bebop movement. So with the encouragement from Clark... John Lewis moved to New York in 1945, where he soon began to work as a pianist and arranger with Dizzy Gillespie's Big Band and as a sideman with the great Charlie Parker. When not playing with jazz masters like Gillespie and Parker, Lewis studied classical music at the Manhattan School of Music, where he eventually earned his master's degree. During this time, Lewis also began hanging out with arranger, composer, and theorist Gil Evans. His connection with Evans landed him a spot in Miles Davis's Nonet. As a group member, Lewis wrote original pieces for the Nonet and also contributed as an arranger. That work can be heard on the album The Birth of the Cool from Miles Davis. Now, as a pianist, Lewis was rarely flashy and did not display the same virtuosity as many of his contemporaries. He relied more on taste than technique. But Lewis's ability to lead, organize, arrange, and compose afforded him one of the most successful jazz careers. As a leader of the modern jazz quartet, John Lewis was primarily responsible for helping to introduce jazz to a broader audience. Okay, this next section is our section called For the Jazz Nerd, and I am, of course, one of those jazz nerds. So I'm going to get a little into the weeds with this, but I'm going to try to make it as clear as possible 
for the uh, casual jazz fan or the developing student. So the track is in standard AABA form and it's 32 bars long. That's very common. That's how long the tune is. AABA referred to the fact that the A sections all contain the same written material, so you're going to hear a lot of the same thing. And the B section is the bridge, which offers new material, so AABA. Each section is eight measures long or eight bars long. That's common. Now the melody, the notes that you hear, are somewhat angular, and they are played in the bebop fashion, but they are also very logical. So the pitches or notes and the rhythms, how the notes are set up through time, of phrase number one, that's a musical idea, uh, measures one and two, mirror phrase number two, measures three and four, so they sound similar. The intervals or pitches are the same except for that they're played a step lower. So imagine somebody playing a riff or a sequence on the guitar, and then they play that same sequence but down two frets closer to the tuning pegs or the headstock. That's what's happening. Now, phrase three, measures four through eight, serve as a musical answer to phrases one and two. And then there's a resting point to close out the final two measures. So there's sort of like this little period of holding a note and resting. And those are your A sections. Now, the bridge, the B section, is less active rhythmically. And it follows a basic rhythm sequence and theme. And then there's a return to the A section. So there's your form, and there is how your tune is melodically and rhythmically structured. Now let's talk about the harmony or the way that the chords move. As for the chords, they are quite logical. The A section moves down by a series of whole steps every two bars before settling back to its home key in measure seven of the A sections. So your key centers, and stick with me, shift from a C major seven to a B flat major seven to an A flat major seven and back to C. So if you we were looking at the left hand of the pianist, you would see that they were gonna be moving uh, to the left of the piano, getting deeper. These are set up by a series of connecting chords as well that musicians refer to as 2-5 chords. So basically these are chords between the key centers that set up the new key. Now the bridge is a little more simplistic. It's basically in the home key of C until measure 10, and then it gets a little strange. The 2-5 chords reference the key of B for one bar, and then those are your chords C sharp minor seven to F sharp seven. It doesn't resolve to B, and instead it goes to the D minor 7 and G7, another series of 2-5 chords that bring you back to the C major 7 tonality, the original key. The point is, the point is that the song changes keys frequently, but it does so logically. And this is part of the bebop tradition. So because of all these elements, the difficulty rating of this song, I would say, is a 7 out of 10. Uh, depending on how fast it's played. If it's played uh, at a more rapid tempo, that difficulty rating goes way up. <laughs> 